As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly-rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with, a, with a, another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 14. Awesome. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, his favorite subject in school was math and recess, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to indeed data plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast and it works like really fast in fact by the time this adds over 23 new hires will have been made on indeed according to indeed data worldwide it's the perfect match of speed and quality 93 percent of employers agree indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites and I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive terms and conditions apply. You need a hire, you need Indeed. We entrepreneurs are at our desks a lot, so having solid equipment is super important. And a sit stand desk can make a huge difference, as many folks on our team will attest to. If you haven't tried one yet, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Over a million customers have chosen Uplift Desk. Innovative product designs, reasonable pricing, same-day shipping, free accessories with every desk. You can see why they're such a big hit. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? And that covers the complete desk, by the way, not just the top or some fine print like that. Moving while you work is just healthier. And Uplift Desk provides a state-of-the-art experience. They're stable, made of very solid materials. There's over 100 desktop choices and customizations available. Just the choices for material for your desk are amazing, all the way from laminate to eco to bamboo to solid wood. If you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. 
Hey, everybody. What's up? Welcome to the 14th session of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am I don't, I'm just in a really, really good mood today. A lot of great things have been happening. I've been asked to speak live at uh, this meetup that uh, is happening up in Oregon in a couple months, and I'll give you more details about that. But this will be my first kind of live speaking gig where I'm talking about what I do uh, for business now, which is awesome, something I've always wanted to do. And I thank you, the podcast listener out there, for helping to motivate me to get comfortable behind a microphone, which will then help me be comfortable speaking in front of a live audience about this kind of stuff. I used to do it a lot back in college. You know, I like many of you know, I was in the marching band and I was in the executive committee of the marching band my senior year. And I'd have to go and speak in front of the band for, uh, you know, every day about a lot of different things. And I, I miss that. Uh, and I feel like I've lost my practice, but by doing this podcast, I'm, I feel a little bit more comfortable. So thank you. Uh, other good things that have been happening, a uh, WordPress plugin that I've been developing for a while has been completed. So I'm running through tests on that and currently building a website to uh, kind of uh, showcase that plugin. Um, and so there will be more details on that later. A few iPhone apps, which is the, the subject of today's session have been completed and will be submitted to iTunes, hopefully in time for a certain event that's happening on February 10th, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, what else has been happening? Uh, just, I mean, just a lot of great things have been happening. And, and uh, it, it's crazy because a couple weeks ago when I was sick, I was just feeling terrible. Uh, and it's, it's kind of crazy how we just kind of ride these waves of good moods and bad moods. And really, it, I mean, we always get back to the good mood. So if you're in a down mood right now or if you're kind of in a dip, you know, you will always go back to a better place. So just as long as you keep working at it, as long as you keep your head up, there's nothing that can stop you. So just just keep going. So, uh, all right. So I'm just going to dive right into the content today. Uh, and, and like I was talking about earlier, we're going to be talking about iPhone apps. And you know, the reason why I want to talk about iPhone apps, or there's a few reasons. I mean, for those of you who don't know, I co-founded an iPhone app company. Uh, it's called Loller Apps, or L-O-L-E-R Apps, um, kind of laugh out louder apps, because most of our apps are just entertainment, uh, kind of creative type applications. Nothing particularly useful, mostly just for fun. But I started that company with a buddy of mine here in San Diego back in 2009, and we started it as an experiment. Uh, like I do with most of the things I do in my blog, to see if it was possible to make money doing it and do well in this market, to earn an income from it after you know putting in hard work to build the applications and then putting them into Apple's App Store. And I'm specifically bringing this up today because it's a really hot topic that a lot of people have been asking me about. I've written a few blog posts about the subject in the past. They've gotten a lot of comments. I thought it'd be cool to talk about it here more in detail, more in depth, specifically for my own experience going through this process about how I got started, how it all works, what kind of figures we're seeing, and some of our marketing strategies for a company that I'm happy to share with you today. Also, as, a record, as I record this during the week of January 24th, 2011, we're about two and a half weeks away from when Verizon will carry the iPhone. That's the February 10th deadline that I'm talking about. Verizon will carry the iPhone. Uh, right now, it's just AT and T. It o has always been AT and T, and now Verizon is going to ca uh, carry it, which is really, really good news for us iPhone app developers. Uh, it, I don't know if it's going to actually double the market, but it could, and so we could potentially see twice as much income or more uh, as a result of this um, uh, this contract, I guess you could say. So we're really excited about that. We're trying to get a few applications out and time it for that date, which I'm sure a lot of other people are doing too, but I don't know if we'll make it, and I'll tell you why uh, later on in this episode. Now, before I get to the good stuff, I wanted to mention a few things up front about this particular part of my business. As you know, I'm involved in a lot of things, niche sites, the blog, this podcast, um, my lead exam site, uh, WordPress plugin development, a whole bunch of things. And, and this is just one part of my passive income portfolio. But we're not making millions from it like you might hear some other people are. I mean, the, those are the people who make the headlines. The, those are the people who are making millions. I mean, for example, there's the indie developer group uh, that created the app Doodle Jump, which is a game. It's pretty fun, actually. I downloaded it. And it's gotten a few million dollars just from... You know, they've earned a couple, a few, out of three or four million dollars from a ninety-nine cent application. Uh, that's ridiculous, and we're not at that level. 
obviously, uh, I'd probably be, I don't know where I'd be right now if I was making $3 million from an iPhone application. But uh, our business actually has about 25 applications live in iTunes right now and counting. And it's making a good amount of income each month. It's averaging about five to six thousand dollars a month. And recently, actually, now that uh, Christmas has passed, and uh, we're always seeing good numbers around the holiday times, um, we're seeing upwards of eight to ten thousand a month, which is awesome. Uh, and and why I believe that this is uh, something that you know we should pay attention uh, pay attention to as far as passive income, not necessarily just dive right into it. And there's certain reasons why, which I'll go over in a second. But it is something. That is a viable income stream. Uh, so our our experiments have have worked out. And secondly, in this session, you're going to learn a lot about the process, the actual process of taking an idea in your head about an application, which I'm sure many of you have had, uh, and and taking you through that that exact process of how to get it in to iTunes and, and, and turn it into a real application. And if I were to detail everything about it, this would be a really long boring and technical session with you because there's a lot to it. I mean, even just taking a finished iPhone application and submitting it to iTunes is not easy and it's seriously a headache. I remember our first application, it took about two weeks. You know, we had it built already and then it took an additional two weeks to figure out exactly how to get everything in order in order to submit it into iTunes Connect, which is where uh, your apps are submitted to then go into approval processes with Apple uh, it, it's crazy. I mean, you have to make sure there's, there's certain uh, key code identifiers and proper licenses and distribution keys and all this and that and this. It's just crazy and, and it's really a headache. So if you want to tackle this industry, you know, I'm not going to give you all of the how-to information here today, but I do have a couple of resources for you at the end that, that may help you if you are interested. Uh, so I'm just letting you know up front. So, okay, let's get right to it. So, you know, why iPhone apps? Why did I choose to go into this business with my partner and, and how did how did it all happen? Well, it was the end of 2008. And for those of you who know, who know my story, 2008 was pretty crazy for me because that was the year I got laid off. It was the year I began to monetize an existing site I had, uh, greenexamacademy.com, which is my lead exam study guide which uh, website, which just took off and changed the rest of my life. So I did have some extra income to, to kind of experiment with and play around with and try to earn more passive income. And I don't know exactly how it came up, but my buddy and I, a really good friend of mine from high school, we just started talking about the iPhone and neither of us had one, but some of our friends did. And we started talking about how we've been reading about a lot of success stories of other people who have been developing applications and doing unbelievably well with them. Uh, there's a guy named Joel Com, who you may know because he developed the iPhone application called iFart. And it's just crazy how much this guy was making. I mean, in December of 2008, uh, he he was making, oh gosh, $20,000, $30,000 a day from this farting application, which is crazy. And that just, I mean, as, as crazy as it sounds, it really inspired us. It was like, okay, if this guy can make this much money from a farting application, uh, we, we should be able to do something, um, you know, uh, but, you know, we, we decided to give it a shot. Uh, there was another one called I Shoot, which was like a tank game, which was doing ridiculously well, too. And, you know, it, the the iPhone app business wasn't a kind of, you know, we're going to drop everything and invest tens of thousands of dollars into this. It was more of an experiment, like I was like I was saying, and one that we thought was worth putting a little cash into to possibly see some return later on. And specifically, we were hoping for passive income since we knew that if we were going to build these applications, we could somehow put them in an Apple's app store and pretty much just set them there and forget them. Uh, well, that, that was the idea, and we'll get into more about how that works later. But that's when we started brainstorming application ideas uh, after we got that inspiration uh, and, and decided to really tackle this and we decided to turn this business into a kind of our creative outlet. Like I was saying, none of the apps that we the, we make for this business are particularly useful. They're not going to change the world, but they are funny. They are entertaining, and and I guess that's what kind of goes along with the inspiration we got from the farting application. We don't have any farting applications, but uh, we do have some some kind of funny ones that I'll talk about in a second uh, that have been doing pretty well actually. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, the the iPhone is a wonderful tool, and I have many applications that I use on a daily basis to actually get a lot of things done in my business, help keep me organized and focused. 
uh, stuff that has actually improved my life. But we decided to just be creative with our apps and see what would happen. So our first application was born. It was called Shake Shake Pop. It's a game where you'd be timed on how fast it would take you to shake a soda bottle. Or the second level was a... uh, Actually, the first level was a can of soda. The second level was a kind of two-liter bottle. And the last level was a wine bottle. And it would progressively get harder as you got up uh, in levels. And you'd actually have to shake your phone to play it. And there'd be sounds and, you know... uh, yeah, a timer is kind of a, a scoreboard and a leaderboard and stuff like that. So that's, that was our first idea. And so I'm going to talk about now how we got that built. So my business partner was actually a computer programmer, and I was I was not. Uh, and and you know even though he knew how to program and and he could learn how to do specifically the iPhone application language. Uh, since he knew about that stuff, we decided it would be better to actually outsource the development of our applications rather than learn to code them ourselves. And this actually turned out to be one of the best decisions we've ever made because instead of spending and wasting time learning how to develop one application, maybe spend six months learning to code and then finally developing an application after uh, you know a couple more months after that and it kind of being mediocre at best, uh, we have been able to find people who were specifically, you know, they learned how to build iPhone apps. That's their business, and that's what they do. And so we were able to get more apps done in a shorter period of time, and the quality of those applications because of the people who were building them was much better than we could ever do on our own. And so we went to elance.com to find a developer. Again, that's elance.com. I've used Elance for a lot of things. And if you don't know what Elance is, it's a website that kind of connects people who want jobs done with people who will do them for a fee or a price. And it's fantastic. I mean, I've used Elance for web design. Uh, it's it's actually where I got my first iteration of the design for the Smart Passive Income blog was from Elance. Uh, graphic design, bookkeeping, legal services, voice talents, ebook editing, copywriting, fixing, you know, even, even fixing, uh, you know, getting ri- rid of a little humming sound in a recording. I found someone to do that from Elance and of course iPhone applications. And then what happens is providers uh, will bid on your project. So you put out a project and you know they'll bid uh, you'll get, you know, 10, 20, 30 different people bidding on your project with different prices, different kind of portfolios that you can search through. And you work with them, you know, after you after you award your uh, uh, a bit after you award a bidder your specific job then you work with them on the site using the message board on elance to keep track of your conversations to exchange files and even handle payments through an escrow pro or excuse me escrow program uh, which is which is really nice and when they complete your job and you're satisfied you leave feedback and a review for them so that other people know the quality of their work it's pretty cool and there's other services like uh odesk uh and rentacoder.com which do the same thing but I've used Elance almost exclusively because uh, I just ha- I just am very familiar with it and I'm confident with the people who I can find on there. So what we did was we posted our job on there. We awarded our uh, application to a developer, and I'll get into app pricing later on in the session. But we chatted with the developer and his team, and uh, you know, uh, after getting after hiring him, we gave him a little description of what we wanted, and uh, we had the application completed in four months. Four months. Now, know that we didn't expect the app to take four months. Uh, we were hoping for maybe one month. And there are several things we did wrong, uh, this being our first time going through this process, that I want to make sure I go over with you so you don't make the same mistakes if you're thinking about doing the same thing. So when we posted the job, we awarded it to the lowest bidder. This was our first time working with a developer, and we didn't really understand kind of the wide range of abilities and experience developers have on Elance. And they ended up completing the app, like I said, in four months, and the quality was okay, but it was obvious they weren't really professionals. Uh, they they never went over the top, and they just kind of did the minimum amount of work that we asked them to do. And you know, first of all, they didn't understand how to give us the application to test. And hypothetically, you could hire someone to develop an application for you and never even test it or use it yourself before it gets submitted to iTunes. But uh, seriously, you want to test your application before you put it out there for people to see. Now, the idea is that as the app gets built, as different versions of it get built, as it develops, the developers can send you versions of it called ad hocs, A-D space H-O-C, which are versions of the application 
that can be used on one or two or three specific iPhone app, uh, I, specific iPhone devices or iPod touches as a way to test the application. Uh, and, and you know, in order for this to happen, you have to get kind of the specific code of those iPhones you want to test it on or serial number, and that has to be implanted into the ad hoc version so that it knows it can be tested and loaded on that device. And I guess this, I mean, all the, like I said, this is a crazy process, but uh, you know, I guess they do this for security issues um, and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know, but all I know is it's a real hassle because our developers could not figure it out. Uh, and uh, we had to watch videos of the application being built, used uh, application being used. We had to watch videos of it being used from their side. So they would film a video of the different you know things as it was progressing and and send it to us, which was totally inconvenient, especially because we wanted to see how things worked, see how it felt in our hands. And I I had an iPhone at the time. I gave them the code that they asked for, and they they just it never it was never working. And every other iPhone app developer I've used after this. You know, we, we didn't go with those people anymore. Uh, every developer we've used after that uh, has, it's been fine. We've been able to test on the on our applications fine. So that was the first thing. Secondly, uh, and this is probably more our mistake, you know, we didn't realize that besides the developers of the application, you should also have someone on board to do the graphics of your application too. We had no idea uh, so when we got our first vis- version, or you know, when we watched the first version to look at, uh, we we saw the graphics, and they were just terrible. And this was our fault, like I said, because we didn't have any graphics for them to include. So they created them themselves, and they're not, you know, usually these developer companies or or people are not graphic design, uh, you know, talented. Uh, so it looked pretty bad. I mean. It, you know, they built it to our specifications. We didn't give them any graphics to use, so they they did what they knew how to do, and it, it just it didn't look like the way we had envisioned it in our head. So now, every time we come up with a new application idea, we make sure we have someone create the graphics beforehand. Uh, you know, even before we uh, give an application uh, description to to someone. And that's good for the developers because they'll have the graphics they need to complete the application per our specifications. They'll have an idea of what it's going to look like as they're building it, which is really helpful for them. And it's good for us, the developer, because we don't have to worry about them not understanding or we don't have to worry about any misunderstandings as far as how things should look. So that was the second thing we did wrong or second thing bad about this first iPhone app experience we had. Thirdly, uh, again, from the videos that we watched of the progression of our application, the app and the actual game flow of how we wanted the app to work was not exactly what we envisioned. And you know, they were building the app based on our description in Elance, and 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 you know, we had collaborated on some further instructions and get, get giving them kind of answers to certain questions they had along the way. But what we learned that uh, you know what we learned is that's not enough. You have to, I mean, you should give clear instructions on exactly every part of your application uh, before you hand it over. Um, uh, you know, exactly what every screen does, what every button on every screen does, where uh, that button goes to everything, uh, what happens in every particular situation that you want. It's got to all be laid out uh, or else the developer is just going to bombard you with questions, which they did with us and that you're not going to have immediate answers to and you're going to have to figure out. Or they're just going to assume something uh, that uh, is supposed to be a certain way and they're just going to fill in the gaps on their own and it's going to be wrong. So, you know, every single little, uh, every single little detail must be explained. So, for example, to be specific, with our Shake Shake Pop application, we had different levels of gameplay, like I was saying, the easy level, which is the soda can, second level, third level, which is the wine bottle. Uh, anyways, at the end of each level, if the user completed it within a certain time frame, you know, maybe say if they uh, exploded the can in five seconds, they would then move on to the next level, right? Sounds simple, and that's exactly what we explained to them. But what we didn't explain was how the player would get to the next level. So, you know, we, we all we did was say, okay, if they pass this level in five seconds, they get access to the second level. Well, we didn't think about it if the player should see a screen that says congratulations and they have to click a button or does it just automatically go there after a few seconds. And what ended up happening was they built the application in the way that if they beat the level in five seconds, it immediately took them to the next level with you know no pause, 
no congratulatory, you know, well done or anything like that. It just immediately went to the next level. Uh, you know, no sound or anything, no buttons to press. And it was really odd to see on, on the videos like, okay, I just uh, shake my phone and, and I passed the level. And now, now what? I don't, okay. Uh, it was just really weird. So, you know, if we had thought about it and actually thought about the actual game flow and exactly every part that we wanted to happen, it would have come out a lot better. We would have not wasted so much time. And we would have probably earned more money too because we would have had the app in the app store a lot sooner. And gosh, just, I mean, just thinking about this process is stressing me out because I remember exactly how stressful it was. You know, every day we would get a new question uh, and and just really make sure that if you are going to go through this process and with anything that you do with with outsourcing, uh, not just iPhone specific, that you really get detailed with exactly what you want to happen. So what we learned and what we've been doing ever since was the best thing you could do is even before you submit an idea to a developer is to wireframe it or map out the entire application. If you can design every single screen and use arrows that point to new screens for when certain buttons are pressed, uh, even better. And it'll take a while to create in the beginning. You know, it'll take a week to build that wireframe. But trust me, it'll save a lot of time. And if you have Photoshop, that works because you can... Uh, you can actually create the graphics as you go along if you're if, if you know how to do that or you can get someone to create the graphics for you and then that way the developer knows exactly what's going on or you can even just do it on paper and sketch it out yourself create a little rectangle and draw little buttons on it and point to this and that and this and explain exactly what you want to happen uh, I had an application done once that was done on 10 pieces of printer paper explaining everything about all the different screens. I named each every single screen and uh, you know certain buttons that pointed to separate screens. I, I, it was easily, uh, you know, I could easily reference them that way. And I just kind of, I just scanned these 10 pages and sent it to the developer. And you know, that app was done in three weeks. Three weeks versus four months. I mean, uh, for, you know, an extra week of time just to, to create this thing, totally worth it. So, you know, other tools that can help you to do this is MindMeister. MindMeister is a mind mapping tool, which I've talked about before, which I actually use every other day uh, to develop new business ideas. It's not iPhone specific. It's just kind of uh, helps you brainstorm ideas and organize your ideas. And this is great when developing your iPhone application idea um, because you can actually figure out what parts and components you want. Uh, for your iPhone app, but it's not a good thing to actually hand over to the developer because they'll need something more linear. Um, uh, mind map is sort of a bubble diagram and it won't really make that much sense. To them. It won't be that useful. So there's a tool called uh, Gliffy, G-L-I-F-F-Y, that is kind of like a workflow, uh, workflow chart tool where you can create uh, flow charts. Uh, so w- it's really good for uh, you know using arrows and, and, and diagrams to point from screen to screen so you could check that out. And there's also, of course, Photoshop. And if you don't have Photoshop, you can use the free Photoshop-like tool called GIMP, G-I-M-P. If you do a Google search for that, you'll find it on the top result, uh, which is like a free open source Photoshop type tool, which is pretty cool. And I'll, I'll hopefully be doing some tutorials for uh, people on the blog later because I know a lot of people can't afford Photoshop um, and would love to do some customized graphic work for themselves instead of waiting weeks or however many days to get a customized graphic from someone else. So uh, look out for that later. So after that, after all that, we finally got that app finished after four months. We submitted it to iTunes and just kind of let it sit there. Uh, and, and we were really fortunate enough to see a good amount of downloads. And you know, it wasn't anything like iFart or Doodle Jump. We weren't making millions. And it didn't take off like we had dreamed. But we kept going because we saw there was potential. We were making money. Uh, and, and, you know, we then took three more ideas we had and submitted them to a different developer to get them all done at the same time. And after after a year, we had a total of four applications in iTunes, which which was pretty good. You know, an average of uh, an application every three months. It's, that's not bad. Now, we let that sit there for a while. Uh, we were earning, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month, actually, from our applications um, these were all paid applications ranging from 99 cents to 2.99, and we were really happy with that. But uh, yeah, I don't know when this happened, when or why exactly this happened. But sometime in early 2010, uh, our part, my partner and I decided to go kind of gung ho with iPhone apps, and we ended up making 21 more. Uh, some of which have done really, uh, really well for us, which is pretty cool. A lot of them have kind of flopped, uh, but a lot of them have done really well. Now I know 21 seems like a lot. 
and uh, I'll go over the pricing later, and it might seem like that's a lot of money to invest, but a lot of these applications are actually built from a template. Um, so we, we have a developer build one version, and then we could swap out images and, and, and sounds and pictures and instructions uh, to make a new one kind of almost for free. Uh, which is pretty cool. We have uh, a few apps that that are built from a single template that way. Now we learned a lot from our mistakes, but we learned a lot also, uh, in, you know, with these twenty one more applications from other successful iPhone apps uh, developers along the way too. So first, we learned that uh, probably the most important thing we learned was that free applications can earn money too, which is pretty cool. Most of the applications we're doing now are free. Uh, and you can earn money from free applications by putting in advertisements and getting paid each time someone clicks on that ad that shows up in your application. It's just like Google AdWords and AdSense that we use to place ads on our sites. You know, all you have to do is just put a piece of code in your app and it automatically generates an advertisement and you get paid per click. And there are several ad services that you can use for this. Uh, the ones we use are AdMob, A-D-M-O-B. That's pretty much just like Google AdSense. Actually, Google owns AdMob, so... Uh, I think they might be even integrating that with AdSense soon. And then there's iAds, which is Apple's version of AdMob or or, or uh, pay-per-click advertising on mobile. Uh, that's I-A-D-S, iAds. And that's that one's really good too. Now the thing is, with, with paid applications, which range from $0.99 cents to $900.99, uh, you know, going up a dollar uh, increments, $0.99, cents, $1.99, $2.99, Apple takes an immediate 30% cut revenue. Uh, you know, they take an immediate 30% of each download. Uh, so, you know, really each download, our profit is $0.69, cents, $1.39, $2.09, et cetera. So obviously, I mean, they take a good chunk, but you could make a lot of money with paid apps. And it's a primary business model that most developers use. And we have an application, actually, that's at the two ninety nine dollars price point. Uh, it's called Baby Maker which kind of fuses two pictures together to create a really ugly baby uh, that has done really well for us. And that actually earns an average of about 80 to $120 per day for us, uh, which is really, which is really, you know, it's outstanding. Now uh, free apps that run ads are good. Actually uh, going to back to the free app model, free apps are good uh, with advertisements because one, you know, people download free apps like crazy uh, just, just because they're free, you know, uh, our our application that uh, our paid application that makes you know eighty to one hundred twenty dollars a day is getting maybe thirty to forty downloads a day, whereas we have uh, an application a free application that is also making you know fifty to eighty dollars a day that's getting five thousand to six thousand downloads a day. So the the difference in downloads is different, but there's a lot of people that just download free apps because they're free. And secondly, you don't make money just from the initial download. But every time someone opens that application, it's a potential for income uh, because, I mean, the ads are always showing. They're always changing, uh, and it's not just the same ad that comes up every time. Now, just to give you an example, the guys from Free the Apps, it's a brand, uh, an independent developer company uh, that I know. Actually, some of my friends from high school own that company. Uh, they're doing tremendously well. I interviewed them on a blog post here at Smart Passive Income which I'll link to in the show notes. And almost all their applications, I'd say maybe 95% of them, are free apps running advertisements. And they are making a killing. It's ridiculous. Almost, I think uh, they're making almost $800,000 a year. Pulling, They're pulling in $800,000 a year, and I'm sure they're really excited for that Verizon launch uh, too. So uh, even, even better than that, though, the guys who developed the game Paper Toss, if you have an iPhone app, you may know what that is. It's a kind of a game where you kind of flick a crumpled paper into a garbage can across an office or something. There's like a fan blowing it. Uh, uh, they've made millions from that one application, and it's free, Paper Toss. Uh, we have a free application, uh, which has been one of our most successful ones, actually, uh, called Traffic Light Changer. And I love talking about this application uh, with people because it's it's a gag application. You know, it would be pretty illegal to actually have a real traffic light changer, uh, something that you could use to change a traffic light uh, at a street corner from red to green. Um, you know, that's you're, you shouldn't have that in in, in a real. You know, if you're if you're a civilian, you shouldn't have that. I mean, police cars have that, and ambulances have that. Uh, but you know, this is a gag application to pretend that you have that. 
And it's totally ridiculous, but it's really funny. Uh, and in the, in the description, it does say it's just for entertainment purposes only. And it's really simple. All it is is just a big green button that when pressed, it emits a sound and does a little animation as if a signal was being produced from your iPhone uh, to change a traffic light from red uh, to green. And really, the, the funny part about it is, uh, you know, half the time it actually works uh, just by a random chance. So you could really kind of fool your friends and... and, and uh, we've been able to fool actually a lot of people uh, who have left reviews actually saying that it does work. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, there's a lot of people who who have left terrible reviews saying it doesn't work, which is also funny. Uh, now, just to give you an idea, this application has been downloaded to t- to this date 856,431 times, almost a million times. And it averages now about three to 4,000 downloads a day, which is, as you can imagine, a lot of ad impressions. And we're seeing anywhere between fifty and hundred dollars in revenue every day from this single adverta- uh, application from advertisements. And uh, just for fun, I just wanted to read you this email I got last week about this application. Um, it, it's 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 priceless. Um, it, it says uh, I won't name who who sent it, but it says just exactly where does the signal exit my iPhone to trigger the traffic light? Which way do I point the point the phone for maximum signal? I love it. <laughs> it's totally awesome. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's uh, one application. Um, you know, an- uh, another thing we learned along the way, uh, which has helped us with our most recent applications, uh, especially when we release new applications, uh, it really helps to boost the rankings of those and the downloads of those, is that many of our latest apps have a more apps button, uh, a button you know within the application that clicks to a page that shows our latest applications, uh, you know, a-, a list that we can update. And this is cool because every single download of all of our applications now, uh, and remember that that one alone has got is getting three to four thousand a day. Uh, each one of those downloads becomes an opportunity for another download of our application, and we have a tracking code on each of our apps that tells us how many times that more apps button has been pressed, and it's about you know two thousand away from one million clicks. Uh, so that has been really helpful. That's something we've learned. Uh, from the free the apps guys and and from other people that we've seen using that as well. So, you know, obviously that doesn't work if you just have one application, but if you have more than one, that's a great way to uh, kind of um, uh, exponentially grow or increase the amount of downloads you have. So here's some additional app market app marketing tips that I've kind of picked up along the way that I'm happy to share with you, uh, which are pretty interesting even if you're not you know into this iPhone app thing. So when you submit your application, after you get it finished by the developer, it'll take about seven days to get notice back from Apple that you've been approved. Now, sometimes you won't get approved uh, for certain reasons. Uh, we had one application that we wanted to try out, which was, uh, it's called um, uh, Balance Tester, I think it was. it's called. Uh, and the idea was that it, you could put the iPhone on your head and walk around kind of like when you see people walk around with books on their head and then if the books fall uh you know you're out of balance well the iphone app it would buzz if you're out of line at all so you have to be standing perfectly straight up in in order for the phone to stay silent and the idea was that it could help you improve your posture it might be fun to see you know who could walk the longest without it going off those types of things well apple came back to us um and you know uh even my business partner warned me that this was probably going to happen. Apple came back with us saying that, you know, that was a danger to the life of the iPhone. Someone might have it fall off their head and break. Uh, And yeah, totally. So we ended up changing that application to a way where you'd have to put it on your hand. Yeah, it doesn't really make much sense, but uh, anymore. Uh, But but we put it out there anyways, uh, and it's still getting a few downloads actually. Uh, But uh, so, so you might not be approved, but you can resubmit your application after you've done what you can to, to try and get it approved. And you can do that as many times as you want. Now, once approved, your app goes live into iTunes after a few hours after you get that notice. And it's put on a new releases list for the rest of the day. And if you go into iTunes on your computer, you'll see that on the bottom there's a list of newly released apps. Those are apps that have been released that day. Now, one thing you could do to help yourself is to go into iTunes Connect, which is, like I said, where you submit your application to Apple. You'll get very familiar with that if you're going through this process. And you change the date to the next day. You're allowed one date change after you get that notice that your application has been approved. You change it to the next day or any future date if you're planning to do some type of 
kind of announced launch or something. And this way, you can have a full day on that new releases list. If you don't change it at all, chances are you'll sh- you'll you know you'll be put on that list at 3 p.m. And then when the next day comes around at 12 a.m., uh, you're off that list. Or all the other apps that have come in for the next day that are ready are there, uh, you know, ahead of you. So you can give yourself a full day on that new releases list. And the reason that's important is because that is your first exposure on iTunes or to people who are looking for for new apps or for any type of apps. And getting on those lists, like the new releases list or any of the other lists, like the top 100 list for all the different categories. And if you can get into the top 100 overall, I mean, that that's that's gold right there. Uh, but but try to get to the top 100 list for each of the different categories, whatever category you put it in. And that gives you immediate exposure to everyone looking for apps on their iPhone and on their computers. And if you're not on those lists, you're basically buried. And really the only hope you have is to be found through searches or for, you know, uh, direct downloads from if you have like a blog or something that's promoting it or, or affiliates or whatever. So, I mean... If you're going through search only, you better have your title optimized and, and think about what keywords people might be searching for uh, and in that in your description too. That's important. So to get into those lists, it, it's it's very challenging because every single application is uh, is competing for those spots and it's all based on downloads. Uh, and it, it depends on the category you're in too. You, if you choose the entertainment category, you're going to have a really tough time because there's so many apps competing for top spots in that category. That said, if you were to get into the top 100, that means you're getting quite a bit of downloads and you're going to get a lot of exposure because that's where most people go to download apps is the entertainment category. That category has the most applications and gets the most downloads. Uh, what you can do is kind of find a category that works for you and your specific app. And I'd actually spend time kind of scouring or, or, or investigating the app store uh, on your computer for a week or so just to see how apps are moving around because before it used to be the lifestyle category was the best one to get into uh, that one had kind of the best download to competitiveness ratio uh, and then it became the utilities category and it kind of changes and evolves over time uh, it's always different so it may be totally different now so I, I'd recommend checking that out now you could try to create buzz for your app if you have like a blog or an existing audience or you could buy ads for your application this is something that we've done in the past and we've had success with Uh, success with so you can go on a site like admob.com which i mentioned when talking about embedding code on your application to show ads you can also do the other side of it like adwords like google adwords where you can instead of being on the side where you put ads in your app you could put your ad in other people's applications to try and get more downloads and it's nice because you can actually track the clicks and see the results immediately Um, it does get fairly expensive in a short amount of time though uh, just to be aware and as far as the hot apps lists and the new and noteworthy lists, you know, getting on those lists is really entirely up to Apple. There's nothing really you could do to control that. However, there are some things you can do to, to kind of influence or, or, or give yourself a better chance of getting on those lists. I've gotten uh, one of our applications got on the new and noteworthy list uh, once uh, out of all 25 that we've done. And now my only advice is actually to just make sure you have really good graphics as it's uh, that'll help you stand out from the thousands of submissions they get per day. I don't know how they handle it at Apple, uh, but usually those apps that are on those lists have really nice looking icons and and really nice looking graphics. And the same thing for podcasts. I know I know that you know the better your podcast logo or your podcast graphic is, the better chance you'll have of getting featured uh, in the new and noteworthy list or kind of the uh, what's hot list. So a third tip I can give you is I wouldn't waste my time on application review sites. This is something we spent a lot of time doing in the beginning, and we got hardly any return on investment on it. Uh, we used to think that that's exactly what you had to do, so we spent a lot of time uh, submitting applications and emailing these authors and bloggers to get uh, reviews for our site uh, for our applications on their sites. And I think we maybe have done like a total of a hundred or so, hundred to one hundred fifty different submissions. And we were only selected twice for an actual review. So our apps were reviewed twice. And honestly, when they were reviewed, it didn't even have uh, a real impact on our download uh, on our download numbers or sales or anything. So it's totally not worth it. Um, so those are some tips for you out there if you're interested in getting in this industry. Uh, hopefully that helps you. I know you guys have uh, probably a lot of questions about this process. So here are a few I know you're probably thinking about. The first question that I... Uh, I'm guessing you have is how much does it cost to get an app developed 
by a developer. Now that will depend on how complicated your application is, uh, kind of the uh, what your idea is. And again, it'll really help if you wireframe, map out everything, and even even just uh, sketch or have everything in place to give to your developer. Then they can give kind of a better uh, bid price or an estimate on on the price that it'll cost. Uh, with Elance, usually it's a pay per project uh, fee, so they'll tell you up front how much it's going to cost to do it overall, and then. On sites like I think like Renacoder or even uh, I know Odesk, you pay per hour, which is kind of difficult, and that's why I don't use Odesk for iPhone apps because I don't really exactly know how many hours it would take to develop uh, an application. And obviously, again, it'll depend on the uh, on how complicated your application is. But how much it'll cost? Uh, I've I've heard people say, "Oh, does it cost ten thousand dollars?" a uh, hundred thousand dollars well maybe depending on what you want to do if you want to get super complicated with it uh we've had applications that we've developed for four hundred dollars four hundred dollars and that's uh, actually the traffic light changer application four hundred dollars and now it's making uh fifty to a hundred dollars a day so that one has been wildly successful uh we've had other applications that we've developed for four thousand dollars and sadly, the one that we did for four thousand isn't doing as well. So, how much it costs uh, doesn't really determine how much you're going to earn from it. So, just want to let you know that up front. If you have a good idea, one that could go viral, one that is useful—I mean, ours aren't particularly useful—but uh, one that many people will download, then you have a better chance. It doesn't matter how much it costs, but you can spend anywhere between four hundred to eight thousand dollars for an application i would say uh, and again it depends on on how complicated you want it to be and what i would do uh, and again this is the nice thing about elance is you could post your job on elance.com and get an idea of how much it's going to cost and that way you can kind of create your budget from there you're not obligated to to select someone uh, after you get those bids although it, it's kind of I don't know, I would say bad practice just to do that for the sake of figuring out how much it would cost. Uh, I would actually look through each of the developers and check out their reviews, their portfolios, see how many returning customers they have. That's a good uh, metric to use if they're going to be good or not. To, and then actually select someone. Um, so that's how much an app would cost. Another question you probably have, uh, one that I actually get a lot, is uh, this. I have a fantastic idea for an iPhone application and I want to hire someone to develop it for me, but how do I protect my idea from being stolen? Great question, something that we were concerned about in the beginning as well. And there's a few things uh, you could do. The first thing you could do is you can have the developer sign an NDA, uh, a non-disclosure agreement, which is basically a contract that just says that they're not allowed to take your idea and that everything you're talking about is just exclusive to both parties that are involved or to all the parties that are involved in that have signed the non-disclosure agreement. Now, to be realistic, that probably won't have much weight if it were to get to kind of uh, the if it were to get to a point where uh, you know the law had to be taken into account. Like if 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 they actually did steal your idea, I don't know how much weight that would that would take. And you know, a lot of these developers are overseas, so I don't know how that comes into play. But you know, honestly, that's something you don't really have to worry about, especially if you're going through Elance, because those are companies that make a living building iPhone applications. Their business is building iPhone applications. And if they're, if word got out that they were stealing ideas, they they wouldn't have a business anymore. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that, you know, they're building iPhone applications for us. Uh, why don't they do it for themselves? I don't know. I, I I don't know why that's the case. I, I guess they they just are good at building Apple cap applications. They don't want to worry about creating the ideas or marketing the uh, the app once it's done. They just want to build it. So uh, you don't really have to worry about it so much. But again, an NDA is good practice. It, it it's a good thing too because it, it gives the developer an understanding that you you mean business. You know, and you want to give someone who you're out. Uh, you want to give a developer or anyone you're outsourcing to uh, kind of an upfront kind of attitude that you do be in business i mean not be totally strict with them and tell them that the you know after they do one thing wrong you're going to cut them but just you know an nda gives them kind of a a seriousness to the whole idea behind your application so number three is do you have to have a mac computer in order to submit applications to itunes you have to have a mac computer 
to run Xcode, which is the program that you use to build applications. Uh, and in order to submit applications to iTunes, you need to get something that you create in Xcode. So you could potentially have someone else develop everything for you, uh, run all the processes in order to get that final product that you need, which will then be submitted to iTunes. Um, and, and, you know, they can actually submit it for you too under your name and all that stuff. Uh, but it's, you know, it's kind of a hassle and I, I like to control the process of submitting the applications myself. Uh, and, and in that way you do need a Mac computer. So that's one thing. If you have a PC and you want to get into this business, that's something you have to think about. Uh, number four, do you think there's still room for success stories in the iPhone application market? Um, that's, that's a good question. And I, I think there is, uh, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I really do think there is because, you know, just like with, with the niche sites and, and selecting keywords, you know, you, we always think that all the good ideas are taken, but then all of a sudden there's, there's new websites out there and, and new ideas and there's new technologies and there's new trends that are coming out that, that make it so that, you know, not all of the good ideas are taken. You just kind of have to realize what's hot or, or what could be hot. And, you know, the, there's new success stories coming out every day from the iPhone app store. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of the, the fruit ninja guys, uh, um, and you know, there's there's a ton of, of people doing really well in the iPhone App Store, but at the same time, there's a lot of people who have built applications that, that have not seen any sort of income at all, or just seen you know a few dollars trickle in every day, and who have not been successful. So, I don't know if you want to say it does involve a little bit of luck, but it might. And uh, you know, I uh, I know for some people, like the Free the Apps guys, they they got big because one of their applications was picked up by a New York Times article just randomly, and they just took off from there, which is awesome. Uh, so um, you know, c- congrats to them for for all their success. Uh, yeah, there's room, but I wouldn't go into this market thinking that you're going to get rich. I wouldn't go into it thinking that you're going to see an immediate return. I would go into it uh, for fun. That's exactly how I'd go into it. That's how, exactly how we went into it. Um, so uh, that, that, that's what I would recommend. I wouldn't dip into your savings to go into this uh, and, and invest in a developer. I wouldn't uh, you know, spend your last dollars on it. But if you had a few extra dollars sitting around and you wanted to take a chance and, and, and have some fun with it too, because it is a fun process, um, you know, seeing something that you spend a good amount of time on be built and on your iPhone is pretty cool. Uh, you know, I, I would do it then, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect much. Let me just say that. Um, but you can't expect a little bit. I mean, we're doing pretty well. So the last question I would say that a lot of people have that you might have is, what about other platforms? Why just the iPhone? Why not? iPad or Android applications. Now with the iPad, we were thinking about going to that. Uh, we didn't go into it immediately because we weren't kind of sure how, you know, a lot like a lot of people, we weren't really sure how the public was going to take it or if the iPad was going to even take off. And obviously it's been doing really well. I think the new iPad's coming out very soon and I'm actually going to pick one up myself. Um, I think there's a camera in it, which is pretty cool. The The first one doesn't have one. And we might uh, begin to actually start developing applications specifically for the iPad. But we also knew that iPhone applications were huge. That's the phone that has the most users. And there's just, you know, it's 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 creating more success stories. Uh, and, and iPhone applications can be used on an iPad as well. So that was one thing. As far as Android applications, you know, it's really tough because it's not just the, you know, you take your application that was built and you just, press a button and then it's immediately an Android application. There's it's actually a totally different language. So, you know, it's kind of like hiring some developer to build a whole new app for you, uh, even though it's the same thing uh, as one that you might already have on, on your iPhone. So it's a little bit more difficult and, you know, it is a very young market still. So there's a lot of opportunity and it's, it is growing. But for some reason, I just feel like the iPhone market is, is where it's at. And obviously, it's it's where it, it has been. And we keep hearing things about iPhone killers or, or you know, iPad killers or Android taking over. And it's, it's never happened yet. 
uh, and, and that just leads me to believe um, that you know Apple, at least for now, is is the place to be. Um, but you know, Android applications is, is a good opportunity, um, and we might we may invest a little bit of money to to test that out and see how it goes. I don't know anything about it. I don't know even know how to submit applications to Android or what the market looks like or anything. So I'd have to do some research on that. So that may be a future uh, podcast episode. So that's a that's a ton of information about this particular business, and I'm I'm in uh, the iPhone app business, and like I said, it's doing fairly well for us. Uh, we're we're very very pleased to see an extra six to ten k a month coming in for doing almost nothing. Now that we've put in the hard work, uh, like I said, most of it done by other developers, and now we're reaping the benefits, which is awesome. It's exactly what we hoped happen. You know, it is a form of passive income in our eyes, uh, and and we do plan on putting out more and hopefully by uh, the Verizon launch. But really, it's hard to time it when working with developers because you never know what's going to, to happen. Like I said before, we had hoped for one month for our first application, and it ended up taking four months. And you just never know what's going to come up, and that's why you really have to try to cover all your bases beforehand before you submit to a developer so you could save time. And every time we've tried to time something with a launch or Christmas or something, it's never worked out. And things are always delayed. So just understand that that is going to happen. That's a part of the process. And if you do end up going into this market and experimenting with it, just expect it. Expect that things are going to be delayed. Um, Do what you can to minimize those delays, but just expect them. Uh, And I do have a couple of resources for you related to iPhone applications if you're actually interested in this business and want to get the sort of kind of step-by-step process that I didn't go over today. There's a fantastic ebook. Uh, called How to Make iPhone Applications Without Programming Experience. I know it's a long name. Uh, it's, it's very helpful and inspirational. It's by the guys from Free the Apps, uh, which you can check out uh, at smartpassiveincome.com slash iPhone apps. Uh, that's a, an affiliate link, so I do earn a commission if you do purchase that ebook from that particular link. Uh, just letting you know. And a few people have actually recently emailed me saying that they got their first applications up live on iTunes using this as their guide, which is pretty cool. Um, I've read through it myself have picked up a lot of great tips. Uh, I didn't use it to guide me through the iPhone app uh, submission process because I, ha- I had already been familiar with it, but it does walk you through that process. Uh, so again, that uh, link is smartpassiveincome.com slash iPhone apps. And then secondly, if you're looking for a developer, uh, like I said, elance.com is a great place to go. If you can't find anyone, just email me on the contact page of my site and I'll give you the name of a developer I've been using from Elance time and time again that has done a wonderful job for me. I'm happy to recommend them. Uh, There's no commission or anything I get from that. I'm just just here to help you and them because I'm I'm happy with the work they've done. And I won't mention them here on the show because I don't want them to get bombarded with requests. But if you're serious about this and want, uh, want to... Uh, go through a process with a reputable developer who will actually help you along the way. I'll give you their company name. So again, just email me uh, from the contact page on smartpassiveincome.com. So that's it. That's all I got for you today. Uh, I guess this is nearly 50 minutes. Wow, I didn't realize it was going to go that long, but I guess I had a lot to say. So thank you guys for uh, staying on and listening. I hope that was something different for you guys, something maybe inspirational, something to start turning the gears in your head. Uh, you know, just just be careful because I know sometimes when you hear new things like this, uh, you just immediately jump into it. Really do your research before you go into it. I don't want you to think that this is your, uh, you know, exit from your nine to five job. You know, I'm just trying to be upfront with you. I'm not trying to hype anything up. I'm just telling you stuff that I've been up to, stuff that is working, stuff that isn't working. And if you do end up deciding to go through this business, you know, hopefully you can use the tips that I gave you today. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment on the blog or email me or whatever. I'm here to help you as always. And to close it off, uh, if you want to get your free copy of my ebook, Ebooks the Smart Way, uh, my guide to uh, creating a killer ebook, how to market it, how to automate it, how to develop it, how to publish it, everything. It's been downloaded over 12,000 times. Check it out at ebooksthesmartway.com. Totally free. That's there for you. Let me know what you think. And again, thank you guys so much for being on uh, You know, session 14. I know it came a little later than I had hoped for, but that was partly due to the fact that I was sick as you, if you haven't listened to it yet, if you listen to episode 13, my voice is like pretty crazy there because I was sick, so I needed some time to recover. But I'm feeling a lot better. Thank you guys for all your best wishes, and I wish you all the best of luck. And until next time, all the best to you. 
And I uh, wish you nothing less than success. So thank you guys. Take care and have a good one. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I highly recommend Problem Solvers, hosted by Jason Pfeiffer, who's been on the show a few times, actually. As you probably heard in the credits, both our shows are on the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On Problem Solvers, Entrepreneur's Editor-in-Chief tells the stories of real founders that solved real problems in their businesses, helping listeners get through any obstacles in their own ventures. And each episode is really distinct and easy to follow, and they're bite-sized too, usually around 15 to 20 minutes. And Jason pulls each story out himself so you can avoid the same crippling problems. Matt and I were recently on the show in episode 302, and Jason recently hosted a great episode on whether anyone could be too quote-unquote curious for a traditional career. Listen to Problem Solvers right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.